Well, this lecture is a brief outline of the history of archaeology. Um, it's accompanied by a film that you'll see in this module. Well, this chart reviews information I presented in the first lecture on how we use date abbreviations. You're probably used to BC and AD, both of which have uh, religious connotations and reference to Christianity. Uh, today, we use Common Era and Before Common Era, uh, CE and BCE. Another one that we use is BP, or Years Before Present. This avoids the uh, ADBC split, uh, but we have to have an anchor point for that. Uh, and so the present for this is defined as 1950 uh, CE. And we'll talk about uh, why that is in a later lecture on radiocarbon date. So why do humans bother about inquiring about the past? Well, humans have a long history, actually, of an interest in the past. Curiosity is part of it. Uh, primates are curious, and we are primates. Uh, people have had a curiosity about their ancestors uh, and how they're related to the past. All groups have stories about what their ancestors did, and so archaeology is just an outgrowth out of that curiosity about the past. One of the earliest uh, evidences we have of uh, concern with the past was Nabonidus from Babylon, 538 BCE. He searched for artifacts and inscriptions while looking for the foundations of a temple he was going to reconstruct. He tried to figure out the relative dates of things, although he was wrong. And as uh, one of the textbooks I've used in the past points out, Nabonidus looked to the physical residues of antiquity, things, to answer questions about the past. That's one of the things that we will focus on in this class, um, thinking from things, moving from artifacts and features to understandings of the past. Petrarch, uh, who some call the father of humanism, uh, was an Italian who is credited with the birth of the Renaissance. Uh, people at this time had a notion that the remote past was somehow perfect. And they looked to the past and its monuments for um, definitions of beauty and uh, uh, harmony. They collected ancient art and texts. Following in this tradition of looking to the past, um, Pizzicoli traveled and studied monuments. Uh, particularly, he's noted for translating the Latin inscription on the Arch of Trajan seen here. Willie and Sandloff were two American archaeologists who classified the, the history of American archaeology, broke it down into periods. Uh, and this applies worldwide to some degree. Uh, they talked about the speculative period, um, the classificatory descriptive period, um, the classificatory historical period with the emphasis on chronology, classificatory historical period, period that moved to a focus on context and function, uh, and then the modern period of explaining and understanding. Now, this work was written um, in the 60s or 70s, and so it doesn't treat um, postmodernism or post-processionalism, which we will discuss. So let's move on in this history by looking at how Europeans figured out that there was deep time, that uh, things happened before written records and uh, so forth. And in this, we'll also look at the uh, beginnings of anthropology and archaeology. During the age of exploration, uh, European nations set out to explore the world. Uh, Columbus, of course, 1492, bumps into um, the New World. But exploration is going on all around the world. And European explorers start encountering people who don't look like Europeans and who don't make their living the way Europeans did. They were hunters and gatherers and fisher folk. Joan Frere is important because he was the first to recognize stone tools in Britain at Hoxney uh, in 1797. Again, stone tools aren't something that's described in the Bible or that people were using in uh, Europe at the time. Uh, he sent a letter describing the finds and arguing that the broken weapons, or rocks were weapons made by humans. That was published in 1800. 
Uh, in France, Boucher de Perth was also looking at stone tools uh, that he found on the river uh, terraces there. He was a French customs inspector, found broken rocks in the gravel quarries of Somme River, France, and he concluded that they were made by humans as well. He published in 1841. His work wasn't generally accepted at the time, uh, but he was visited by a couple of uh, British scholars, John Evans and Joseph Pestwich in 1859, and they were finally convinced that the artifacts, that the, the stones, the broken stones were made by humans. Other theories uh, before the work of uh, Boucher de Perth uh, were that they were thunderstones, that these were stones that were created when uh, lightning hit the ground, that they may have been made by fairies or trolls, uh, but uh, Boucher de Perth uh, convinced people that they were human uh, in manufacture. And then there were the bones, uh, like this skeleton from the Neander Valley uh, in Germany. A very, very human-like, but note the skull is uh, flatter and has a thicker brow ridge than humans. Clearly not human, but very, very human-like. So the questions that were raised by these things were, how do we account for people with different life ways encountered by explorers? Who made those early stone tools? And how do we explain the bones from the Neander Valley and others that are clearly not modern humans? Well, let us throw in here the work of Charles um, Lyell and James Hutton. Um, remember that the primary explanatory text that people used in Europe at the time was the Bible. And uh, Bishop Usher, an Irish bisher, bishop, had uh, concluded based on all the generations in the Bible, going back and looking at who begat whom and making some assumptions about the length of the generations, uh, determined that the world had been created on October 22nd, 4004 BC. James Hutton, looking at uh, evidence on the cooling of the earth and uh, other uh, things, estimated an age that was much, much greater, established the antiquity of the earth then. He also contributed to uniformitarianism, which was Charles Lyell's uh, big contribution. Uniformitarianism is the principle that the stratification of rocks is due to processes still going on in the seas, rivers, and lakes. That is, that geological, geologically ancient conditions were in essence similar to or uniform with those of our own time. Darwin comes in on the scene, uh, publishing Origin of the Species in 1859. Uh, this is a very popular book. Uh, it talked about the mechanism for human evolution. Uh, anthropology became a separate academic field in the 19th century. They studied how humans progressed to a civilized cultural existence, following out on that theme of human evolution of evolution in general. Unilineal evolution then was one of the first paradigms or, or points of view that anthropologists used. It applied the theory of evolution to culture. Uh, the two principal names that we associate with unilineal evolution are E.B. Tyler and Lewis Henry Morgan. Uh, and their notion was one of progress, that humans must have progressed through a series of stages. Uh, the stages were savagery, barbarism, and then civilization, the highest form of society. Um, savagery was simple hunting and gathering folk, like the explorers saw in some of their uh, the new places they bumped into. Barbarism was simple farming, and civilization was the highest form of society, essentially what was going on in Europe at the time. Tyler also studied religion and uh, uh, and other things, but it was the unilineal evolution, uh, um, the application of, of evolutionary theory to culture that they were known for. The way you did uh, uh, unilineal evolution was to compile accounts of other cultures written by observers. That would be uh, military folks, uh, missionaries, uh, government officials. Uh, compare the cultures to determine which are the simplest and which are the most complex, and then classify those into the stages of development. 
The labels of the stages, as I said, were savagery, barbarism, and civilization. Uh, you place the new culture in the classification, and then you invent an explanation for why people in one stage developed into the next stage. But the basic thought was that any culture left on its own would progress through these stages if they had ample time and resources. The speculative period um, in William Phillips' uh, classification was a time when people were trying to figure out the past, figure out what those monuments meant, figure out what uh, archaeological sites meant and how to do it. There were antiquarians who acquired things, and there were archaeologists who were trying to figure out the past, taking the first steps. Questions included, you know, where did Native Americans come from? Who built the mounds? Thomas Jefferson was one of the first to investigate that particular issue. Lyell publishes his Principles of Geology in 1840, which introduces the notion of uniformitarianism, and that's a, a, a big landmark and really sort of changes things. The first people then who systematically investigated archaeological sites uh, in the past were antiquarians. Uh, Kelly and Thomas define antiquarians as originally someone who studied antiquities, that is, ancient objects, largely for the sake of the objects themselves and not to understand the people of the culture that produced them. One of my favorites is uh, Giovanni Belzoni. He was an early antiquarian. He was a circus weightlifter who was born in Italy. He wound up in Egypt, uh, did a lot of looting to uh, film museums in Europe, uh, but did take notes and make drawings. And he accumulated a lot of firsts. Here's a picture of one of his projects retrieving uh, part of one of the great statues of Ramses II, I believe. He was the first European to enter the temple at Abu Simbel. He was the first European to enter the Giza pyramids. He removed a six-ton obelisk from uh, Philae. He discovered five tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And he inspired Percy Bysshe Shelley's famous um, poem, Ozymandias. Ozymandias, by the British Romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk in a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, uh, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level stands stretch far away. One of the areas of speculation was where did the people of the New World come from? They weren't accounted for in the Bible. Were they the lost tribes of Israel? Perhaps they were Vikings or other Europeans. Could they have come across a land bridge? The first to suggest the land bridge was Jose de Acosta in uh, 1554. And this was at a time before the Bering Strait area had been described. But he saw similarities between native peoples in South America and those of Asia and speculated that they may have come through some kind of land connection. In the classificatory descriptive period, people were concerned with describing what was out there and trying to classify it. Also trying to answer some questions, though. One of the things that we'll talk about a little later in this lecture is the mound builder controversy. Squire and Davis began studying these mounds using what we'll call the direct historic approach, um, going from Native Americans in the area and trying to work their way backwards. Uh, John Wesley Powell later directed Cyrus Thomas and William Henry Holmes uh, to work on them through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And again, we'll discuss this in more detail uh, a little later in this lecture. Large museums began to be built, mostly in the East, and they needed things to display. Um, they sent expeditions to the American Southwest, for instance, to collect items to fill museum cases. Early anthropologists even bought artifacts from local uh, people, establishing a tradition of mining sites uh, 
uh, for artifacts in the American Southwest and elsewhere. Uh, old archaeologists, the early archaeologists, are, are to blame for much of the pot hunting, the relic hunting that goes on in the Southwest today. That process in the early 20th century of paying uh, farmers and ranchers for artifacts. One of the early folks to work in the Southwest was Richard Wetherill. He was a rancher. He had a little ranch in uh, Memphis, Colorado, uh, right near Mesa Verde. And he and his uh, his ranch hands were trying to round up strays, and uh, they discovered the cliff dwellings for white people. The Utes knew they were there, but uh, he discovered them for white folks. Um, that was in 1888. Uh, he thought, this is cool. And uh, so he became a tour guide and collector for the museums. He contributed to the archaeology of the area. The, the classification that we use of Pueblo and Basket Maker comes from uh, Wetherill's work. Uh, he explored Chaco Canyon and actually had a, a trading post inside of Pueblo Benito that he had built uh, after dynamiting through the back wall. Uh, in this period, uh, Christian J. Thompson uh, made the contribution of developing the three age system. He was a Danish scholar who worked at the uh, National Museum of Copenhagen. And he was trying to organize the collections at the museum to, so that they made sense somehow. And he noticed that there were sort of three kinds of sites. Sites that produced stone tools that seemed to be very whole. Uh, sites that produced tools uh, of bronze, and those seemed to be not quite as old. Uh, and then Iron Age, which was even more recent. He published this in 1836, uh, and an English edition was published in 1848. So the three age system was an important contribution he made. Jens Jacob Amason Vorse uh, might be called the first professional archaeologist. Kelly and Thomas uh, did in their textbook. He was born in Denmark. He was fascinated by artifacts. He volunteered with Thompson in organizing the collections at uh, the Museum of Copenhagen. He published his first book at the age of 22, Primeval Antiquities of Denmark and later became the um, Inspector of Conservation of Antiquarian Monuments. He was the first professor of archeology span at the University of Denmark. Unlike archeologists before him, he really excavated not to recover things, but to answer questions. Uh, for instance, when he looked at the shell mittens, uh, he, did, he said of them uh, that they were Heaps were the, were the places where the people of the neighborhood in that far off time took their meals as witness, for example, the potsherds, charcoal, bones of animals, and stone implements. So he's asking questions, what do these sites mean? Definitions here, midden, which we just mentioned, is a refuse deposit resulting from human activities, generally consisting of sediment, food remains, such as charred seeds, animal bones and shell, and discarded artifacts. The photo on this slide is a, a lens of shell midden on uh, San Clemente Island at the Eel Point site. Potsherd, which he also used in uh, that definition, is defined simply as a broken piece of pottery. And notice that's shard and not shard. Uh, one of my favorites, Gert Gertrude Caton Thompson. Um, she was born to a wealthy family traveled on, uh, traveled the world, including to Egypt, Greece, Palestine, uh, and Malta when she was young. And that fueled an interest in antiquities. She wound up meeting uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, and the archeologist Gertrude Bell at the Paris Peace Talks in 1919. She began her formal study of archeology span in 1921 and worked with Sir Flinders Petrie in Egypt, on one project, she slept in a tomb with a loaded revolver under her pillow for protection from the hyenas in the area. While others were obsessed with tombs and the goodies that came from tombs, Hayden Thompson was the first to excavate an Egyptian village, asking what were the common people doing? She's also involved with Great Zimbabwe. And Great Zimbabwe is a site in Zimbabwe. Uh, that was obviously the center of some kind of, of huge uh, civilization. And the early debate was, of course, well, Africans couldn't have done this, just as 
Native Americans couldn't have built the mounds. But she went in and studied the site. Uh, she observed the stratification, uh, the layering of the sediments. Uh, she was able to date it to the 13th or 14th century. So it was too young to be biblical. And one of the other explanations was this was um, an outpost of folks mentioned in the Bibles, in the Bible. She came to, uh, she concluded that it was completely of African origin. And there's a photo of Great Zimbabwe or some of the restored remains today. So stratigraphy, we mentioned in the last slide, and that's the site's physical structure produced by the deposition of geological and or cultural sediments into layers or strata. We'll talk much more about this later on. The Mount Builder controversy was something that came up during this period, as I mentioned earlier. And it has to do with whether or not the great mound complexes of the eastern woodlands were built by Native Americans or by other people who were more sophisticated in the minds of the people who were asking the questions. At the, um, at the end of this module, uh, in module 2.3, uh, you'll view the film Odyssey, Myths of the Mound Builders, which will cover this uh, in detail. John Wesley Powell. Um, was a Civil War veteran and a Western explorer. He was responsible for founding the U.S. Geological Survey and uh, germane to this class, the Bureau of American Ethnography, uh, which looked at the anthropology of the American Indian and dealt with archaeology as well. Uh, he noted, for instance, in 1891 that Southwestern ethnography was both feasible and needed since there were tribes that were still living an Aboriginal lifestyle in the area. He was responsible for a large amount of work, including um, work related to the Mound Builder controversy. Um, the next period was a classificatory historical period with the uh, emphasis on chronology, 1914 to 1940. Uh, and several means of figuring out uh, the age of things, either uh, relative to one another or in terms of the calendar. Uh, were developed during this period. We'll talk about seriation, tree ring dating, and the study of the strata of archaeological sites, stratigraphy. A.V. Kidder worked at Pecos Pueblo and developed the uh, Pueblo, or the Pecos classification system, which is still used in modified both form by archaeologists throughout the southwestern United States today. And that's Kidder uh, and the, the great Kiva at uh, Pecos Pueblo. This is the Pecos classification, uh, basically, and it arrayed the cultures as they were beginning to notice patterning uh, in the cultures in the, the archaeological cultures in the Southwest. Uh, they wound up putting names on the basket maker two was uh, one of the early spirits. They started with hypothesized basket maker one, um, and they went from basket maker to Pueblo. That's a distinction that uh, Richard Weatherill developed, actually. Uh, but the divisions, Pueblo 1, Pueblo 2, Pueblo 3, and Pueblo 4, um, are things that uh, were developed based on the relative position of things and the relative age of things. Similar schemes were developed in, the other, in other parts of the world as well, laying out the sequence of cultures. I know the three age system we talked about uh, stone, bronze, and iron, copper age thrown in here. This is for the uh, Transdanubian area uh, of Germany. The general anthropological consensus uh, in the early 1900s was that humans couldn't have been in the New World very long or uh, they would have developed higher civilizations than they did. And so it's thought they were only there around 4,000 years. We'll talk more about the Folsom discovery later, but the finding of a Folsom point and uh, uh, with extinct bison ribs, meaning that uh, they were at least 10,000 years, extended the time frame that humans had been in the New World. Chronology was a huge issue during this period, and an astronomer, A.E. Douglas from the University of Arizona, made a critical contribution to chronological studies. He was trying to understand sunset spot cycles, and uh, he thought that they might be related to precipitation and tree growth. And to explore this, he started looking at 
counting rings and trees and wanted to extend the ring uh, chronology back. And so he worked with archaeologists uh, and developed the tree ring chronology for the American Southwest, a technique that's been applied in a number of areas. But that technique can give us a date uh, for which a tree was cut or when it was uh, quit growing. Uh, and if that tree is part of an archaeological site, then something about the date of the site. The next period was uh, the classificatory historical period where context and function became the focus. Once dating uh, got settled with uh, the use of uh, seriation, ordering things uh, as in the three age system uh, and uh, dendrochronology and stratigraphy, then they moved into looking at what those things meant, uh, moved to understanding cultures. Settlement patterns were a topic, and uh, radiocarbon dating was developed at the beginning of this period, again, aiding in setting up the sequences that allowed people to look at change. Salvage archaeology also was a, something that came into being in uh, between 1940 and 1960. Uh, Marie Warmington. Uh, Marie Warmington was from Denver, Colorado. She wound up taking a class at the University of Denver in archaeology and was hooked. Uh, she became the archaeologist for the Denver Museum of Natural History, now the Denver Museum of Science, or of History and Science. She took time off to get her PhD at Radcliffe and then returned to the uh, Denver Museum. She wrote classic works unlike uh, Ancient Man in North America, which was a textbook when I was an, uh, an undergraduate, as was her work, uh, Prehistoric Indians of the Southwest. She was the first American anthropologist uh, in the USSR and the first to visit the People's Republic of China. I had a great encounter with her at the SAA meetings in Las Vegas, Nevada. Don't remember the year, but I think it was probably the earlier mid-80s. Uh, and I was uh, sitting at a party. My uh, graduate school, uh, WSU, <coughs> always has a great party at the SAA meetings. And I was standing there in this uh, meeting room with my late friend, Karen Dom, and we were talking. And all of a sudden, I feel her elbow in my ribs. And she says, you know who that is over there? Well, that's Marie Warrington. I said, cool. She said, I'm going to go introduce myself. Come along. I said, no, she didn't. She didn't want to meet a couple of wet behind the ears graduate students. Karen said, suit yourself. I'm going. And she grabbed me by the sleeve and drug me along with her. We introduced ourselves. And Dr. Warmington was just delightful. We had this most marvelous conversation. She talked candidly about her work at Thule Springs, a pioneering uh, site that explored serious multidisciplinary research. I was located just outside of Las Vegas. She said, you know, when I was working on Tule Springs, I was pretty good at the tables, but my companion tonight isn't interested in spending much time at them. Uh, we talked a little more, and finally, when we uh, went to take our leave, uh, she looks at us, and as I recall, probably patted each of us on the wrist and said, you know, dearies, uh, if you're ever in Denver, I'm in the phone book. Give me a call. You can come over and have a cup of tea. The modern period in William Phillips classification uh, really begins in 1960 uh, with Benford and the new archaeology. Uh, processual archaeology has come to be called. It was explicitly scientific. It involved hypothesis testing and um, CRM archaeology was growing up at the same time. Lewis Benford um, was a <laughs> feisty uh, gentleman who uh, is considered the founder of the new archaeology. Um, he saw it as scientific archaeology. He developed the notion of middle range theory, uh, making archaeology explicitly scientific. He uh, um, lobbied for deductive reasoning and hypothesis testing. The publication that started it all off was a collaboration between Lou Benford and his then wife, Sally Benford. Uh, you can check her out on Trowelblazer's website, uh, as well as seeing stories about Marie Warmington and others. Uh, but this was New Perspectives in Archaeology. 
The focus of this book and later publications was on the process of culture, not the history of culture before, but the way in which culture operated, hence the term processualism for this point of view. Archaeologists needed to explore more than just when things happen, but look at the why of them. Um, they admitted that archaeologists couldn't dig up languages or kinship technologies or religious systems, but Benford argued that we can excavate the physical remains of those systems. He further argued that cultural behavior is pattern and that patterned behavior should result in patterns in the archaeological record. Archaeologists must develop theory, he suggested, that allows them to infer things about the nature of cultural systems based on the patterning of the remains. Systems theory then was a main component of processual archaeology. Uh, to illustrate a system, and this is a very uh, simple uh, illustration of a system. The systems involve inputs and uh, changes in state and so forth. And a toilet bowl is a really good excavation. At steady state, you have the flapper covering the drain, the tank is full of water, the float is at the top, closing the valve. But when you change the state of the system, that is, you press the handle and open the flap, the water all runs out. Uh, <clears throat> and the system operates to return to equilibrium. When the flap closes, uh, the float has sunk, which opens the valve, which lets water into the tank and fills it until the point where equilibrium is reached. That is, when the float raises to the point that it shuts off the fill valve. And then the process happens all over again. Now, cultural systems or any kind of system is much more complicated than this simple uh, illustration. But this is sort of what systems theory is about, looking at the inputs and the environmental factors the changes in state and uh, the different equilibrium states. Conceptual models were also very important. This would be a uh, sort of a complex constructual mo or structural model of uh, a cultural system. William Longacre was one of the proponents of this, and he began to explore things like, could we detect matter locality uh, in the archeological record? He looked at a, uh, southwestern Pueblo for his doctoral dissertation uh, and looked at the uh, distribution of design pottery uh, patterns in ceramics and trying to trying to infer whether or not there were groups of potters and whether or not the men uh, were coming in and living uh, in the women's households. A very interesting piece of work. It's been criticized, but a very good piece of work. Um, another great archaeology story is I, I bumped into uh, to Bill Longacre at uh, one of the meetings uh, a few years before he passed away. I was sitting having dinner by myself in the, uh, the small little restaurant at the, um, at the hotel. And I noticed uh, Bill, I didn't know who he was, but I noticed him there. And I was just sitting minding my own business. And at one point I hear him say, you must be an archeologist. I said, yes. And so we introduced each other and, and we were Facebook friends until he died. Very interesting and uh, uh, gracious gentleman. He went on to do ethnoarchaeological research, looking at ceramic manufacture and breakage in ceramic populations. My, um, my major professor for my uh, dissertation uh, at WSU was W.D. Leip, William D. Leip. Uh, he had explored Anasazi social organization for his doctoral dissertation. Uh, he and um, R.G. Manson around the Cedar Mesa project, again, looking at change through time and settlement patterns and the causes for those changes. Uh, he was one of the principal investigators on the Dolores Archaeological Program uh, and worked uh, after that with Crow Canyon School and is still involved with Crow Canyon School. And in 1974, wrote the classic article on conservation archaeology, something that we will talk about in further lectures. Post-processual archaeology was a reaction in the 1970s and later to the uh, processualism. It's an outgrowth of the postmodernist critique in general. Uh, it encompasses a rejection of science as an artificial and biased construct. Science is seen as privileging the views of the capitalist elites, who they say are old white guys to explain what went on in the past. Post-processualism favors the interpretive approach. 
Any interpretation is as good as any other, say many of the post-processionists. They would argue that there is no objective truth, so it's just the quality of the story. We'll talk more about this in a later lecture. There are some positive contributions to the post-processual um, critique. The interpretive perspective is a good one, and it's been adopted by many archaeologists today. They also included in the people that they focused on folks who are normally excluded in archaeological studies. What was the role of women? What did everyday people do? Um, what about the people that history doesn't include? The laborers, the slaves. The current picture in archaeology then uh, is, that, is one that includes elements of both processual and post-processual views. Some archaeologists practice both approaches simultaneously. Um, it's important though, there is a focus on explicit examination of bias and, and trying to make it uh, make it known and eliminate it when we can. Um, more effort directed at unrepresented populations and the inclusions of native voices, another topic that we'll return to. Decolonization has become a thing in archeology span and an important one. Um, colonial archeology span is demonstrated both in the uh, mound builder debate and in Great Zimbabwe, both of which were notion, uh, started with the notion that the people who live in the areas today of Great Zimbabwe or where the, of the mound cultures or who lived in the areas of contact weren't capable of building these great things. Um, Repatriation, returning remains to groups, sacred remains, burials, and other things is a part of decolonization. Inclusion of descendant uh, populations, points of view, and critical re-examination of past work. And I can't stress enough that we as archaeologists have to be able to own up to the sins of our ancestors if we're to have a future at all, our intellectual ancestors. You know, we no longer go out and dig cemeteries because they have the coolest stuff. We don't dig cemeteries today unless they are in, in danger of being destroyed. And then it's with uh, descendant population uh, participation and buy-in. Um, Park Service and the Little Bighorn uh, Battlefield is a good example. Um, one of my graduate school colleagues, um, Bob Hart, examined the changing interpretation of the battlefield at the park. And the, ch the battlefield has been interpreted to the public in different ways depending on national views on Native Americans. It is oscillated between depicting Custer as a hero who is massacred by um, bloodthirsty savages on the one hand, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Custer as kind of a very bad general who did stupid things and uh, was wiped out by people who were defending their territory. We'll talk more about uh, decolonization in general again in later lectures. So please uh, proceed to the two films and uh, uh, thank you.